Hi, Bill here. I uh, wanted to talk today about uh, something called Babesia, uh, or actually Babesiosis would be more accurate. Um, this is a Lyme disease related illness that uh, is uh, transferred by ticks primarily, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Some people uh, will say that uh, you know, Lyme disease and, and co-infections such as Babesia are only transmitted by deer ticks and that's it, and that's not true. Um, these uh, diseases can be carried by a number of different vectors and a number of different ways of transmission, so uh, I won't get into that too much detail here, but I'll uh, just say that uh, another thing that you'll hear out there is, um, you know, of people that uh, have contracted Lyme disease, uh, uh, majority of them also have what's called co-infections such as Babesia. So, um, so what is Babesia? Um, Babesia is a protozoan. Uh, some people might refer to it as a pyroplasm, I believe. I'm not sure if that's technically, technically correct, but for the purposes of this video, we won't get into too much technical stuff. Um, but I just wanted to really describe to you, you know, what it is and uh, how to look for the symptoms and uh, you know, possible uh, ways of being diagnosed you know, through testing and, and, and then different treatments, possible treatments for it. And, uh, so I probably won't get into any of those subjects too deeply here. This will be too long of a video for most people to watch, but uh, I won't even really get too far into my uh, history with that. I, I do have Babesia and, uh, along with Lyme and Bartonella. And uh, one of my uh, videos, or a couple of my videos early on, you can scroll down the whole way to the bottom of my videos there, and I, I did go through a lot of my history, you know, and the symptoms that I had leading up to, you know, finding out what was going on. Uh, so you can watch those or rewatch those. I won't get into too much of that uh, history here. So, um, so yeah, like I said, what is Babesia? You know, Babesia is a protozoan, and uh, what it is is a it's a microscopic protozoan that attacks red, your red blood cells in your bloodstream. Uh, so it's different than a bacteria. You know, it's way bigger than a bacteria being a protozoan parasite. Um, you know, you might have, uh, depending on what that bacteria and what protozoan, um, you know, protozoan might be dozens or hundreds of, or thousands of times bigger than some bacteria. So, you know, where you might have uh, hundreds or thousands of bacteria invading one red blood cell for you know, some diseases out there. Babesia is a bigger parasite that you might have one or just a handful of them uh, in your blood cells. And uh, it causes a whole array of different symptoms and different problems. Uh, some of them overlap with Lyme and, and Bartonella and some of the other infections that we can get along with. You know, with Lyme, um, but some of them are also unique to Babesia. Uh, so I just thought I would explain, you know, what that is. And sorry, I keep itching my nose here. The air is really dry here in Pennsylvania because it got super cold again. Uh, I'll just read a list, list of symptoms of Babesia, and I, ex I experienced almost every one of these um, starting about three years ago. Um, so let's go through the list. Night sweats and sometimes day sweats as well. You know, I had a lot of that going on for a while there, and it would just come out of nowhere. You know, I could be sitting in 50 degree weather, and all of a sudden I would break into a sweat. But a lot of it was at night, you know, laying in bed or real early in the morning. Uh, next, shortness of breath, air hunger, sighing. So that's another big thing. Um, I believe the shortness of breath is part of, um, you know, the way it attacks your red blood cells. It uh, you know, it kills red blood cells, so your blood oxygen level won't be what it needs to be to carry oxygen to your cells. So, so that's a big one there that can cause a whole lot of grief. Uh, next, dry chronic cough. A lot of people uh, refer to this as an unproductive cough. You know, it feels like you need to cough something up, but you can't. And uh, so what happens is, you know, you think you're you know, going to cough something up and you just can't. You're, you're wondering why you've got this weird cough. I had that a lot, especially early in the morning, like first thing in the morning. Fullness in the throat, difficulty swallowing, severe headaches, dull all over your head, feels like your head's in a vice. I, I used to 
say it, you know, it feels like an elephant's uh, stepping on my head. Um, just all over headache. Um, dizziness, lightheadedness, I had that big time. Um, you know, sometimes it was just this kind of day long, slight off feeling, you know, slight dizziness or lightheadedness, and other times it was full blown, really bad, you know, dizziness and, and, or vertigo, um, where it would come on suddenly. Um, capillary angio, I probably butchered the pronunciation of this, capillary angiomas, uh, especially on the chest. So what this is, and I had this for a while too before I even knew what was going on, whether I had a BZ or what. Um, it looks like little, little, uh, I'm going to say blood blisters that are kind of on your skin, just little red uh, marks, just real little ones, like maybe only a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Uh, so just little, what looks like little red blood blisters on your skin. Uh, vasculitis, red skin with white splotches. I've had that once or twice on and off, not a whole lot. Hormone imbalance. <laughs> yeah, I always felt like, uh, you know, you were on a roller coaster as far as hormones and, and emotions a lot of the time. Um, easy bruising, you know, and that goes back to the red blood cell thing, you know, you, you know, you bruise real easy. Um, burning symptoms, so that would be, you know, like skin feeling like it's burning. Head, tooth, sinus, and jaw symptoms, that's very common with a lot of people. Um, a lot of people get, you know, like the TMJ type stuff going on with this. I, I've never had that, th thankfully, because it sounds like that can be miserable. Uh, Bell's palsy, this is another one, you know, maybe overlaps with Lyme and, and different things, you know, it's where you get um, numbness or uh, sort of loss of control of your face, you know, and I've even, um, you know, I think I've, it's affected my speech a little bit. I don't know if it's obvious to anybody or not. It, it seems like it's affected my speech a little bit with just a slight, you know, amount of palsy of some type going on there that hasn't gone away. Nausea, that was a huge one for me, um, you know, along with, you know, obviously the dizziness and the vertigo, that'll cause the nausea, but also uh, just nausea in general, had a lot of that. Ear ringing, this is another huge one with a lot of people with, um, you know, tinnitus or tinnitus, they call it, you know, and same thing that can overlap with Lyme and other stuff too. Blurry vision, um, I had that a lot, um, you know, and it was sort of like a, overall blurry vision sometimes and other times it was more like a migraine aura coming on uh, vivid violent dreams and nightmares I had this really bad like it was like what is going on what is, you know what is wrong with me like very vivid and very memorable you know I'd wake up and remember what it was you were having a nightmare about flushing you know that's sort of you know like a heat coming on I guess uh, flare-ups every four to six days this is a uh, very interesting thing here. Sorry, I got to take a drink. My throat's getting dry from this dry air. The, uh, the four, to day, four to six day cycle, I think is unique to Babesia compared to Lyme. Lyme has more of a, uh, about a month long cycle in general. Um, you know, it can come and go and wax and wane and sometimes it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, you, it's pretty noticeable sometimes when you're having this four to six day flare up that there's something else going on here. This is different than just Lyme. Uh, failure to respond to Lyme treatment. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, one last one here. Feeling of spaciness, wooziness, and impending doom. So, you know, this was just a lot of, goes along with that. Um, not just the, um, you know, the brain fog like I'm dis uh, displaying right now, um, but, uh, you know, also the dizziness and, and the uh, fatigue and, and you know how it affects everything. It affects your you know your hormones, your uh, all kinds of stuff. So getting back to that failure to uh, respond to Lyme treatment, uh, since Babesia is a protozoan, it's different from a bacteria, so it's not going to respond to the same treatments that they use for bacteria. Most antibiotics are not uh, going to work for Babesia. And uh, so I'll get to that in a second, too. So the one thing about uh, Babesia, you know, there's different tests for it. There's um, PCR tests. There's different blood smears. There's, uh, I'm trying to remember how it's pronounced, uh, fluorescent in C2 hybridization assay, uh, a.k.a. fish test. So uh, I'd say between all of those, obviously, uh, 
direct blood smear would be pre preferable to see it, but not too many people do that because it's you know time intensive and uh, you know it's just not done very often. So I, you know, I would say maybe the PCR and, and the and the fish test would be right, right now, as far as I know, that would be the preferable tests. And uh, and for a long time, another thing I'll say: uh, there's different species of Babesia. There's over a hundred species that they found and at least a dozen that are known to uh, infect people. And uh, so a lot of the tests were only for one species, which is the main one, which is Babesia microti. Um, but there's also Duncani, I think it used to be called Wall One, and there's uh, Divergens, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that are out there. That uh, So if you're getting a test done that's only testing for one species, obviously if you have one of the other species, it's not going to show up. So that's been one drawback, you know, not just with Babesia testing, but with Lyme testing and Bartonella testing and everything else out there. So, uh, but the one thing I would say, you know, you want to go to one of the big um, testing companies like Agenix is pretty much right now, as far as I know, uh, that's the best one. And I think they may even have uh, panels of testing now where they test for multiple species. So, You'll have to go to a uh, doctor that will, uh, you know, do the blood draw and send it off for testing at those uh, those companies. Uh, to and then as with Lyme tests, I'll say it right here, you know, there's very, you know, good testing out there now, but it's not 100%. It's still possible to have a false negative uh, and still have Babesia. So, and plus, like I said, there's so many different species that you may still have Babesia and just not one that was caught on the test. So as with Lyme, you know, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's, uh, you know, you're looking at the whole symptom picture and, you know, you might be confirmed by a test and you might not. And depending on whether you've been on any medications or treatment that might affect it or how long you've been infected. Um, you know, for me, it was probably about a year and a half um, that I'd been sick before I got tested. And uh, and one thing, you know, you can also look at, you know, like I said, a lot of these symptoms overlap with Lyme and co-infections. And uh, I've gone online, you know, different things when I first started looking into this. I, uh, you know, I did a lot of research, as I've said in some of my other videos. I'm an engineer, so I decided I was going to research, research this thing and find out everything I could about it. So I uh, found, you know, some of the leading doctors out there that have treated... 10,000 plus Lyme patients and co-infection patients, including Babesia, one of them being Richard Horowitz, and, and he's got a couple of books out there, um, Why Can't I Get Better and How Can I Get Better, I believe are the two uh, main books that he's written, and he's got all kinds of uh, other stuff out there online, and uh, you know, I, I actually have a playlist of doctor talks on my YouTube channel here, so that might be something interesting for you, especially if you're just uh, looking into this or even if you've been doing this for a while. I got a whole bunch of them on there. You know, some of them talk about Babesia. Um, so the one thing a lot of these doctors uh, will have is a uh, kind of a survey, uh, like a, I guess you'd say a symptom questionnaire. And, you know, I went on Horowitz's website. I believe his website is cangetbetter.com. I might be wrong on that, but I'll try to post some of this stuff down in the description for you whenever I put this up. So Horowitz had a Lyme, uh, what he calls MSIDS questionnaire, multiple systemic infectious disease uh, questionnaire. And I went down through it, you know, and it goes through a whole bunch of different sections and a whole bunch of different, um, you know, symptoms, uh, 53 different symptoms. And, you know, when you get done with this, you get a total score. And, you know, it says if you scored under 21, you probably don't have tick-borne illnesses. If you scored between 21 and 45, possibly. If you scored 46 or more, high probability that you have tick-borne disorders. And uh, I had 97 when I took that one. <laughs> so that was uh, pretty obvious. And another guy, uh, Joseph Boriscano, he... Uh, he just hasn't written any big books per se, but he has uh, what's called the Lyme guidelines that are still used on ILADS, and I'll put a uh, link to that. Uh, he has a lot of good information in there. He uh, he also treated 10,000 plus 
Lyme patients over the years, and I believe he actually uh, left private practice to go into more of the research side of this uh, thing. And he has the same kind of thing, a questionnaire with three pages of uh, symptoms that you figure out, you know, what severity you have of them. And, you know, same thing, you know, you get to the bottom and you have a certain score, you know, unlikely four or below, possible five to six, highly likely seven or above. Uh, 14 is what I had. So I said all that just to try to demonstrate that there's a lot of, um, you know, overlap between the symptoms of Lyme and and Babesia, and uh, like I said, you know, the majority of people that have Lyme also have one or more of the co-infections, such as myself. And yeah, I suppose it is possible; it's definitely possible to have Babesia and not have Lyme. I, I know one guy; he keeps testing negative for Lyme. That doesn't mean he doesn't have Lyme, but he's been struggling with Babesia big time. So, so I just wanted to give a quick, uh, not so quick. I'm past 15 minutes now, but I just wanted to go into. Uh, you know, symptoms and, and just real quick, you know, on testing. And, and as far as treatments go, uh, like I said, the uh, regular antibiotics will not cover Babesia. There's uh, Babesia, uh, I think I forgot to mention Babesia, you know, since it's like a red blood cell parasite, it's similar, similar to malaria. I guess you could say it's sort of like a, a cousin to malaria. And uh, so there's anti-malaria drugs like Mepron and, and Malarone that are Atovaquone uh, that are effective for Babesia uh, prescription medications, and they're usually taken along with an erythromycin, uh, something like a Zithromax or a uh, Biaxin, you know, clarithromycin, uh, something like that along with them. And also, you know, there's other ways of going about it. There's uh, herbal protocols. Uh, there's, you know, there's Booner and there's other different uh, protocols out there. I actually personally did the, uh, the Malarone and the uh, Clarithromycin and and Flagyl and uh, and Booner's herbal protocol, and uh, it was you know a tough uh, journey. But uh, after several months, the the uh, symptoms went away, and so far it's been uh, almost a year that I haven't had those Babesia symptoms. I'm continue to uh, you know fight Lyme and Bartonella. I attacked the Babesia first, I guess you could say, and then I moved on to the other ones. So. You know, some doctors will say they prefer doing it like that. Some doctors prefer to do it all at once. Um, you know, and everybody's different, and that's you know one thing. Everybody's different. Everybody responds differently and has different symptom picture, has a different terrain in their body. You know, so there's no cookie cutter approach to this. And I just wanted to just give some general information. If anybody uh, has any more questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, leave whatever comments you want below or whatever questions and uh, and I just want to urge you if you do have a lot of these symptoms to please you know think about it and look into it um, you know because it's uh, it's serious you know it's 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 really serious for your health to have these infections and the sooner you can find out you know what's going on and address them the better off you're going to be like I said for me I was misdiagnosed and undiagnosed for a couple of years before you know, trying to figure out what was going on before I finally figured out what was going on. So then it made it tougher to to treat it and beat this thing. But, um, you know, there is hope. You know, there is uh, a lot of things you can do, you know, not just treatment-wise, but a lot of things, diet and, and, you know, just limiting stress and trying to sleep. And, you know, that that one's a tough one, I know, for all you people with Lyme disease and Babesia and co-infections is getting good sleep. You know, and a lot of those things are important. So... So I just wanted to uh, put this out there. Um, like I said, any uh, questions or any comments, please leave them below. Thank you.